I have no doubt that this was all cooked up to help Biden get reelected to the extent that they're trying to basically, they're issuing a lot of bills in order to cap long-term interest rates. And by keeping long-term interest rates artificially low, they're basically sending investors into the arms of the stock market. That's why the stock market's booming, the economy's doing well, because U.S. is financing this huge deficit with basically very, very short-term use, basically, uh, basically IOUs. This is clearly not sustainable. This is obviously very bullish gold because it's bullish gold to the extent that, you know, it means higher, you know, geopolitical risk premium. Also, of course, higher energy price, high oil price. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter. And of course, your host for this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to this one because it's with a new guest that we haven't had on the channel. Always excited, always a bit nervous when we have a new guest because uh, we never know where the, uh, the conversations are going to go. Of course, we got some topics lined up. Uh, we're going to talk U.S. elections. What is happening in the U.S.? Are we going to see a new presidential candidate from, a Dem uh, from the Democratic Party? What is the impact on the economy? What does that really mean? And uh, how things will be different or how will put things be different come November? Also, this has huge implications on the Fed. Is it is it just uh, nonpartisan? What do you think? And uh, really curious what my guest thinks, especially when it comes to rate cuts and uh, maybe rate hike decisions as well here. Uh, we're going to zoom out a little bit, talk uh, global economy, BRICS, but also, of course, gold. Uh, why is the gold price holding up? Where is it headed? And uh, who's buying gold right now? So lo lots to discuss. But uh, before I switch over to my guest, by the way, it's David Wu. Uh, he's the founder and CEO, CEO of David Wu Unbound, a global investment boutique advisory firm. Really looking forward to that discussion. But uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. We really appreciate it. Now, without much further ado, David, it is a pleasure to welcome you on the program. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really looking forward to this. As I mentioned, like first time guest, uh, just just maybe real quick, just so we can uh, set the scene a little bit and uh, see where your head is at, David. Uh, can you quickly introduce yourself before we dive into some of the topics? Yeah, so I am. I'm an American. I, um, I have a PhD in economics from Columbia University. After that, I joined the IMF, International Monetary Fund, where I started my career in Washington, D.C. After that, I moved to London. I ran uh, EM strategy for Citibank, and then went on to run currency strategy for Barclays Capital. And in 2010, Bank of America offered me a job in New York I couldn't turn down. So I've moved to New York and ran global macro strategy for Bank of America for the last 10 years. I was the number one ranked, basically, macro strategy team on Wall Street for the last three years. And then in 2021, I decided to retire. And, the, um, and I thought that in my spare time, I would basically share my knowledge with you know the wider public my wife has always accused me for essentially making a living making rich people even richer so i thought that well, i'll give something back to people so i launched my own youtube channel in the hope of making the stuff that i know a little bit more accessible to everybody whether it's in the realm of economics politics geopolitics or for the matter investing Phenomenal. Really appreciate your time there, David, and really looking forward to what we what we can discuss here, because our mission is to educate so people can make better investment decisions and so that they understand what is happening in the world. And why is the price of gold moving the, the way it is, for example? That's why we're doing all of this. So really appreciate it. But let, let, let's dive right in. L lots is going on. Um, I mentioned it in the opening here. Uh, U.S. elections, I think, is a big, big topic. I think the press will be all over this for the next six months um, until the election day, because are we going to see a new uh, uh, Democratic uh, candidate here and what is what are the implications david what, what are your expectations what are your thoughts i think i think first of all we have to take some I mean, whatever you're thinking about like how to invest your money you got to basically think what is, what is already priced in because you only have an edge if you disagree with what's priced in so from that point of view we have to ask ourselves what has been priced in by the market about the election especially after the debate last week now i can tell you what is very clear in case you know people are wondering is that we've seen, obviously, a steepening of the U.S. yield curve. In other words, long-term bond yields have gone up more than the front end of the U.S. yield curve. The dollar strengthened, and defense stocks have gotten crushed, and oil prices have gone up. I think all of this is consistent with the idea that the market is now pricing a Trump victory. The market is assuming that, you know what, if Trump gets in, you're going to get bigger budget deficits, or there's a steeper curve, 
you know, he said that he's going to basically impose tariff, a 10% tariff on all U.S. imports. That means higher inflation. So again, basically higher long-term interest rates. <clears throat> At the same time, to the extent higher real interest rates means, well, guess what? A stronger dollar because U.S. You know, bonds are going to be more attractive. The dollar has done very well. To the extent Trump has promised to end the war in Ukraine in one day, defense stocks have sold off sharply this week. And to the extent people believe that Trump is going to uh, be much tougher on Iran when it comes to his oil export, this is the reason why oil prices have gone up actually this week quite significantly. So I would argue what the market is pricing today is that it's going to be a slam dunk for Trump. And I personally think that, you know, while I'm arguing, you know, I mean, you can Google me, you know, like I was the only analyst on Wall Street in 2016 who correctly called Trump's basically victory. And I like to think of myself as being a Trump supporter, or at least supporter of Trump's policies. But I think it's not a done deal. OK, I think that debate, ironically, could actually, you know, basically, you know, actually turn out to have very different implications than what the market's pricing in. And that's where it gets very, very interesting. Because for one thing, I would argue the next few days are going to be crucial from the point of view of the, what the polls are going to tell us about Biden's viability as presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. I think it was very clear when he met with Obama on Sunday, you know, the, the, the verdict was that let's wait and see. Let's see what the polls say before we basically rush into a judgment, especially given his wife clearly is very adamant for him to stay in the race. But I think if he were to basically come off sharply, let's say he goes from, you know, right now it's 50-50, let's just go to 40-60. I think 40-60, you could argue that would be a mortal blow. He won't be able to recover from it. And I think that will, with that, you're probably going to see increased pressure for him to step aside. I think, you know, a lot of people are going to be in the running. I think Gavin Newsom has no chance of basically beating Trump because I don't see him basically winning in either Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And there's no doubt the only way Democratic Party is going to be able to win the election against Trump is by winning all these three states. And, you know, Gavin Newsom, you know, who is from California, slick, you know, arguably, you know, on the feminine side, I don't think that the blue collar working class basically states like these three states I just mentioned are going to look upon him with too much basically uh, fondness. So I think that he's not going to be the guy who's going to be able to challenge Trump, nor do I think Michelle Obama is going to be, was going to want to run. Michelle Obama, much like Trump, you know, they've had it pretty easy their entire life, I would argue. They haven't really failed. So they don't know what it means to fail, and then they're probably very afraid of failing. For her to jump in the race and get into a mud wrestle with Trump for the next four months, which would be no fun, and then risk losing, I think that's a risk that I don't think she would be prepared to take. I mean, at least that's my bet. Which leaves me, and then I think Kamala Harris is basically a no-go. I mean, because I mean, her approval rating is even lower than that of Biden. So I think there's no doubt that Biden has stands a better chance of beating Trump than Kamala Harris. So that leaves me with only one person, and that is um, Gretchen Whitmore, you know, the governor of Michigan. I somehow think that she could very well emerge as a dark horse in this in this basically between now and the Democratic Party convention. But be that as it may, I think there will be a lot of uncertainty. I think uncertainty is going to go up. I think, you know, you will see a lot of volatility in the market, especially there are a number of unintended consequences. I'm happy to talk about you have got time that I think can potentially rock the market, especially including in terms of driving gold higher. Really good commentary. Like one person I'm missing on all of this is uh, Hillary Clinton. It's uh, you, 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 uh, you mentioned Gretchen Whitmer, the, the dark horse, but uh, is there that unicorn, that secret unicorn, is potentially Hillary Clinton? Because she does not, she does not show up on any of the uh, the comparison charts. Uh, Hillary Clinton does. So, so I'm curious, like, what are your thoughts? Is there is there a chance that she will enter the race? I'd be very surprised. I mean, I mean, her health hasn't been all that great, and I think the fact that she hasn't been like, you know, listen, if she would serious she would have been hugging the camera for the last three months much like gavin newsom has been hugging the camera gavin newsom has made it very clear his intention as a you know basically the guy in waiting looking to jump in if anything happens to basically fight i think hillary clinton i think it's very clear that i think you know not only she has quite i think there are question marks about her health but also i think you know like people are going to think that you know, especially someone who's lost basically Trump in the past, 
you know, it's difficult to make the case that she stands a better chance than Biden. Remember, she's also quite old, too. So I think from that point of view, I'm not sure if, if, if you were to basically persuade Biden to stand aside. By the way, the only way the Democratic Party is going to replace Biden is if, it's only if he agrees to stand aside. OK, because otherwise you're talking about a very violent civil war inside the Democratic Party, which would be very costly for the entire party ahead of the election. So from that point of view, I think, while well, you can make the case, perhaps, that maybe a younger person okay, stands a better chance than Biden to bring Hillary Clinton, who has already lost to Trump once and who is also quite old and so on and so forth. I think that I don't think Biden is going to agree to that. Now, interesting, interesting commentary. And let's uh, let, let, let's play it out a little bit. So if Trump wins, what are some of the other ramifications? Because you mentioned the U.S. dollar is actually fairly strong. And I'm curious because... In his uh, former, in his first term, Trump said, "Like, well, he wants to weaken the dollar to enhance uh, the economic activity in the country." So I'm curious, like, what kind of policies? Uh, what, what, what's his goal? Like, let, let's understand this. Like, I've been trying to read up on it, like, on his financial, like, economic policies, and there is not much besides a few headlines, right? So let's dive a little deeper into that. Like, what, what are your expectations for like a U.S. dollar uh, policy? Yeah. Right. I think when you think about the U.S. dollar, I mean, obviously, the dollar has done very well under Biden. Now, you ask yourself, why has the dollar done so well under basically Joe Biden, right? I would argue it's because the foreign policy pursued by the Biden administration. The foreign policy basically under the Biden administration has been very much about securing U.S. hegemony, okay? So from that point of view, just think about this, right? I mean, under whereas Trump, you know, was the first president since Jimmy Carter, who did not commit U.S. troops into any new foreign conflict. Under Biden, the world is literally teetering, teetering on the edge of World War III. And all thanks to Biden's basically policy to pursue basically to basically about American hegemony. I mean, just think about this. I mean, you sit in Germany. I have no doubt. I, I'm very much of the view that it was Biden and his policy that provoked Russia into, you know, invading Ukraine. I mean, Biden and his people basically are, were openly basically talking about Ukraine becoming a NATO member in 2000 and basically 21, leaving Putin has no choice. Putin actually amassed the troops on the border for a whole year. And Putin was sending people constantly to Washington and said, please do not allow Ukraine to join NATO. And then basically Biden basically said, go screw yourself. And that was it. That was the rest of history. Now, as we know, why is why does that decision, the decision to basically you know tell Russia to go screw itself and then basically forcing Russia to invade Ukraine, why was that so bullish for the U.S. dollar? Because guess what? I mean, I think by now everybody knows that basically U.S. is very far away from the theater, whereas Europe is very close by, whereas U.S. is energy independent. U.S. allies, whether it's Europe or Japan. They were huge importers of energy, especially Russian energy. So as a result, there's no doubt, like, you know, basically by provoking this conflict, okay, between Russia and Ukraine in the quest to protect U.S. hegemony, there's no doubt the dollar has been very strong and the euro has been very weak. Europe, and especially Germany, has been the biggest victim of basically Biden's foreign policy. For the same reason that Russia, U.S. has gone out of its way to pick fights with basically China, like I don't have to tell you, good example, of course, is that Ursula von der Leyen, who is the biggest China hawk, who is basically playing to the tombs of Washington, who is now jumping on the bandwagon of trade war against China, the EV tariffs that she announced basically against Chinese uh, EVs three weeks ago. I don't have to tell you, immediately after that, BMW stocks, you know, Volkswagen stocks all got crushed. So from that point of view, and then the euro went down. So the point here is, is I think, you know, my view is that Biden's foreign policy, ironically, I mean, you know, people tend to think, oh, well, Trump is about making America great. That's nonsense. Trump's what Trump means by make America great is to make the little guys in America great. He doesn't care about American prestige on the international stage, not unless the little guys in America can benefit. Whereas the people around basically the Biden administration, all they care about is democracy, human rights, and all these things that in the end have pushed them 
basically pursue a very, very aggressive policy that has so far cost hundreds of thousands, basically, of lives around the world. So, but be that as it may, so that, I think, is going to be a very big difference between Trump versus basically Biden. I think Trump is going to be a more transactional president. Trump said, you know, just think about this. Trump, Trump always realized, Trump was very, very acutely aware of the fact that the two biggest adversaries facing the U.S. were China and Russia. So therefore, Trump did everything to stop China and Russia from joining forces. This is why whenever Trump talked about Xi Jinping, he said, wow, Xi Jinping is a great man. He's my best friend. Every time he talked about Putin, he would say, well, Putin is a great man. He's my best friend. That's why as long as Trump was president, Russia and China kept their distance. It was not until Biden came along that it was as though he presided over a shotgun wedding between Russia and China. And then the world has not looked back since. So what I'm telling you is this. Ironically, I think Trump will be a much more transactional president. He doesn't care if China is a dictatorship or democracy. He just wants to do deals. And he understands as a businessman, a good deal usually involves both sides basically being the winners. And this is the basic attitude I think Trump will bring, which I think actually will be good for Europe. It will be good for Japan. It will be good for the Europe, U.S. allies. And I think in general, that probably will be all oil has been equal, you know, more negative for the dollar, but the world will be a better place. And I think, frankly speaking, that that's that's what we can basically hope for. If we break down what you just said, David, I think the, the U.S. economy actually dictates a Trump victory because you mentioned like the, the little guy is hurting. Right. And uh, the, the U.S. economy, you were to break down the U.S. economy. Officially, we're not in a recession. But depending on who you ask who on the street, pe people are hurting left, right and center. It depends on a little bit on the industry you're in. But in general, people are hurting. Right. So based on that, like, isn't it a clear signal that Trump is actually going to win because he has the little guy behind him because Biden doesn't care about what, uh, you know, the U.S. itself. It only cares about foreign policy and uh, how America looks to the outside. Like, let, maybe let's uh, break down the U.S. economy and what that looks like as a, you know, as a part B of that question there. But uh, isn't, isn't that true? I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, why do you think, why do you think that right now, polls after polls show that maybe as much as 20 percent of black Americans say they're going to vote for Trump. I mean, to put that in perspective, by the way, in 2016, I think Trump got 12% of black votes, which made him like, you know, which was the highest ever since I think Richard Nixon in 50 years for a Republican presidential candidate. Like this time, if he gets 20%, this is going to be like a slam dunk. And the Hispanics, I mean, there are many states where he now commands the majority of Hispanics in terms of voter intention voting for him. Why is that? Well, think about this. He just brought in maybe... I mean, officially 12 million people, unofficially probably 20 million people. And Germany's complaining about like, what, half a million basically Syrians and Afghans that they have trouble integrating. The U.S. just brought in maybe 20 million people. And these 20 million people are taking jobs from Americans. There's no question about that. And then they also get Medicaid. They get social services. There are attacks on the American basically system right now. So again, this is about whether you, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I have to say I, I respect Trump because I, I believe in democracy. Because in a democracy, okay, whether you're the president, prime minister, your job is to first of all look after your own people. Only your own people have been looked after, you can go look after somebody else. And yet the Biden administration seems to care much more about the Mexicans, the South American, Venezuelan, the Iranians, the the Ukrainians more than they do Americans. And this is where I've got a big problem. So from that point of view, I think, you know, this election in that sense really is about, it's going to be a referendum on globalism. Now, there is no doubt that, you know, basically the Biden administration, I mean, whether it's Biden himself, I think, you know, the guy is so senile, I don't, can, I don't think he can tell a difference. But his basically administration, his policies have been basically managed and run by globalists. And I think what you're seeing, what you're going to see in this election is a backlash, okay? And I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, uh, and, 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 and I think the Democrats are going to be very surprised when this happens.
Yeah, uh, 100%. And uh, I think we've seen that in 2016 as well. We've seen a lot of, um, I don't know the right term for it, but uh, David, like dark voters, people that voted for Trump but wouldn't publicly admit to it even in uh, um, in surveys prior or be- before the election. Do you expect the same thing to happen or are people actually proud to vote for Trump this time? But before that, they were time, like sort of honestly, uh, secret. I'll tell you the difference between 2016 and 2020. In 2016, as you said, you know, you know, there was this what I call the embarrassment bias, which meant, you know, that that was the reason why basically the post basically missed it. Okay. In 2020, by the way, I mean, whether you thought that, you know, well, while you think whether you think that, you know, Trump, you know, basically Democrats won it fair and square. The point here is that, you know, in the end, the margin of victory of Biden over Trump was a lot smaller than actually what the polls were suggesting, right? Because Trump only lost by 40,000 votes. I mean, you know, that's 40,000 votes, the combined of the votes that he lost, that he didn't, that, he, that could have basically made a difference that's in Wisconsin, Arizona, and basically in Georgia. But the point here is I think last time it was not so much people were too embarrassed to admit the win of the vote, but they didn't trust the polls, okay? To the extent that if you're Republicans, you, will, you were basically literally scared that if you were, if somebody called you up and said, well, who are you going to vote for? I'm from NBC. If you said you're going to vote for Trump, you might get into trouble for that. And this is why in 2020, a lot of people didn't basically, a lot of Trump supporters simply refused to participate in any polls. And this is why I think polls underrepresented, I think, a lot of Trump supporters. I think this time, I don't think you're going to get that. I think this time, you know, I think the baggage is gone. I think this time it is very clear. You know, like people are voting because I think in some sense, I think after eight years, I think American voters have matured. Okay, to the extent that German voters clearly have not, because otherwise AFD should have a lot more than 16 percent because Germans are still in denial about the situation. But in the U.S., I think American voters have matured. They're going to vote based on results in this election, not based on what somebody says, what somebody tells you what and so on and so forth. This time they can judge. Okay, because Americans have been bombarded with fake news for the last eight years. And this time they're going to judge. They are much more politically savvy than they were eight years ago. And this time, in my view, they're going to judge for themselves who has a better track record. And that's what this election is going to be about. Just one correction there is like as a German, I think the Germans are more scared of a repeat of 1930 or 1940 than uh, uh, the but by voting for the AFD, I think that is the main reason because that's what they always point out here. Like, Listen, I, think I think on the AFD, economic side, say, there's a lot of valid points, yeah. right? I, I, but, I'm, I, I have to say, I live in Israel, by the way. I live in oh. Israel, and I'm a big supporter of AFD, and I'm no doubt in Israel as well, because I'm telling you. I mean, again, there's a lot of fake news out in Germany. If you look at what AFD actually stands for, their platform, again, who knows? I mean, maybe there are neo Nazis in that. You know, and it, basically, when you have it, any party, they're going to be some bad apples. But if you actually look at the policy platform of AFD, I think they are center right, maximum. You know, they're center right, and I think from that point of view, very reasonable. In fact, very pragmatic party. I think the way they've gone about. So from that point of view, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that um, we'll we'll, fi- we'll find out in September. I think I hopefully they're going to do very well in Saxony, and. Um, and Brandenburg. No, no, it's going to be interesting, definitely, how, how that develops. But um, back, back, back to the U.S., David. Let's. Uh, I want to generalize a bit more because uh, one, one thing I'm curious about, like, how much wiggle room will the next U.S. president actually have on a monetary and, and fiscal side? Um, like, how flexible can he be talking about the U.S. debt ceiling, the debt issue, but also the Fed balance sheet and maybe next Fed chair as well? Like, how, how stable is uh, Jerome Powell's job right now? But uh, more, more importantly, like, how much wiggle room does the next U.S. president have when it comes to actually developing their economic policies and executing on them. Right. What, listen, I mean, it's very simple. When you have a budget deficit of $2 trillion, there is not that much wiggle room. I mean, I just want to drive this. I want to just drive home this point because this is a very important point, which is that, you know, yeah. So the U.S. is running a $2 trillion deficit right now. You say, well, you know, like you barely notice it. I mean, to the extent that it's hard to see any evidence that this deficit is doing any bad thing, like interest rates are high, but they're not that high, the economy's doing well, there's not been that much, there has been no evidence of crowding out of private investment. So like, what's going on here? Do we even care 
about the deficit being two trillion dollars. Now, this comes. This is a very important question to answer. And by the way, if you want to get into the answer to this question, which is very important, with the, especially if you're a gold bug, you should check out my video on my YouTube channel. It's called the American Fiscal Chicanery, which I think really gets to the heart of the matter. But to summarize, let me tell you this. I mean, this is the most important. This is the thing that ought to be in the New York Times, but it's not. Which is the fact that in the last 12 months, okay, U.S. has had to basically issue $2 trillion worth of Treasury securities to fund the deficit. But out of that $2 trillion of Treasury securities issued by the U.S. government, only $500 billion of them are actually bonds and notes. In other words, like, you know, basically, you know, an IOU that has the maturity more than one year, because anything less than one year is called a bill. Okay. So only 500, only a quarter of what they issued, okay, were bonds and notes. And guess what? During this last 12 months, foreign investors bought about $500 billion of bonds and notes, which means that the only debt instrument that the U.S. government issued to Americans were all treasury bills, meaning with a maturity less than one year. Could be three-month bill, six-month bill, whatever. In other words, they've been issuing very, very, very short-term paper to finance this massive budget deficit. Now, why are they doing this? It's very simple. I mean, this is the cynic in me. Obviously, it goes out saying, I've never seen, I've done this for a very long time. And I, you know, like I was voted as one of the 12 smartest people on Wall Street by Business Insider. You can look me up. I'm like quoted everywhere. I'm ran basically rates and rates research. So I know something about this issue if anybody knows anything about it. I have no doubt that this was all cooked up to help Biden get reelected to the extent that they're trying to basically, they're issuing a lot of bills in order to cap long-term interest rates. And by keeping long-term interest rates artificially low, they're basically sending investors into the arms of the stock market. That's why the stock market's booming, the economy's doing well, because US is financing this huge deficit with basically very, very short-term use, basically, uh, basically IOUs. This is clearly not sustainable, by the way, because in the past, so we're talking about 20% of U.S. financing is, is done through basically notes and bonds. Whereas in the past, it would have been like the other way around. It would have been 20% will be bills, 80% will be bonds and notes. Right now, it's 20% bonds and notes and 80% basically bills. This is not sustainable unless U.S. plans to become the next Turkey, because that's how Turkey finances budget deficit with basically short-term paper. But what this actually means is this. I mean, if you want to know, which is that all this is going to do is it's going to delay the day of reckoning. Because the $1.5 trillion of bills that they issued this year, they're all going to mature sometime in 2025, okay? Which means that they'll have to get rolled over. There will be another half a trillion dollars of notes and bonds that will mature next year too. Which means that the refinancing requirement next year is going to be $2 trillion. On top of that, you're going to have another $2 trillion in terms of the U.S. budget deficit. So you're talking about $4 trillion of gross financing requirement that whoever is going to be the next president will be basically facing. That is like massive. That ought to be the biggest story. But obviously, you know, Wall Street Journal doesn't want to tell the story. J.P. Morgan doesn't want to write about the story because if they write about the story, the next day, Jamie Dimon will be called into the Treasury Secretary's office and say, what are you trying to do here? I'm telling you, it's all about the U.S. election. And the U.S., the Biden administration is doing everything to prop up the economy, even by resorting to financial and engineering, what I call basically financial black magic. What's the role in the, of the Fed in all of this, David? I'm curious, like, what, what role does Jerome Powell play simple. in this? I mean, it's, I mean, people tend to, people give the Fed much too much, basically, importance. <laughs> but what I can tell you is this, by basically issuing bills, this is the reason why, I mean, because by issuing bills, you're basically creating a shortage of bonds and notes, and that's driving down long-term interest rates. And that is offsetting the tightening up from basically Fed policies. Right? This is the reason why the Fed has been hiking rates for two years, and we've seen very little evidence of tightening of financial conditions. We've seen very little tight, we've seen very little evidence of crowding out of private investment. Because so from that point of view, everything the U.S. Treasury is doing is counterproductive to basically what the Fed is trying to do. Okay, that's the great irony about this. Okay, 
But the point here is this is why it's not like the US economy is made of different stuff. But in this particular case, I mean, the, the financial engineering is truly breathtaking. I've never seen, I, you know, I've lived through a lot of basically administration. I've never seen, I mean, another example of this, it's a great example, which is the fact that the, this administration, Biden has, for the last 24 months, this administration stopped enforcing the existing U.S. sanctions on the Iranian oil export. As a result, Iranian oil export went from 250,000 barrels per day to now 1.5 million barrels per day. And the reason why the Biden administration decided to stop enforcing these sanctions is to cap oil price to the upside so as to help Biden get reelected. Because for Biden to get reelected, he needs low oil price, not high oil price, for the same reason he needs low interest rates and not high interest rates. So just imagine if you're thinking about all this, this is one of the reasons why gold has done so well, right? Because gold, gold tends to, that, that's what it is. I mean, listen, if, if it weren't for basically, you know, long-term interest rates being capped, right? I mean, basically, long-term interest would be much higher, okay? And gold price probably be much lower, actually, by the way. But, but, you know, so anybody who's made money from gold needs to thank Biden because he's the one who provoked the war in Ukraine. And that's obviously, you know, war premium is good for um, increased, basically, geopolitical risk premium is good for gold. He's also capping long-term interest rates in the U.S., which is basically making the dollar stronger than would be otherwise, you know, and so on and so forth. So all in all, that's why, like, you know, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that gold as an instrument, I mean, gold is not the only one, obviously. Gold is just one of tiny, tiny, tiny asset in this huge financial markets that we are basically involved in every single day. But, but there's no doubt all this, you know, is, is all, you know, all roads lead to Rome. And I think there's no doubt that this administration has done more to basically shape the financial market than any other administration that I can think of. Just about an hour ago, uh, Fed Chair Powell was uh, speaking at the ECB forum, and uh, he mentioned that there's resuming to see signs of disinflationary trends and uh, that they've made progress on inflation. So it seems like he's paving the way for a rate cut. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Would a, would a rate cut uh, prop up Biden? Would that make him look better or worse? Uh, the market's already priced that in. I mean, the market is pricing one cut before the election, you know, you know essentially uh, most likely in September. You know, market's pricing another cut basically shortly after that, before year end in November. So basically, if you look at what the market's pricing, it's pricing about a little bit less than two cuts, you know, before the end of this year. And of course, pricing another basically 150 basis point cuts in 2025. Now, I think, you know, I mean, I think for the Fed, it's pretty simple at the end of the day. I mean, they're kind of like in a pretty good position to the extent the economy has done okay up to now. So this is why they don't feel like they're in a rush to cut interest rates, right? So they can basically sit there and say, well, you know, we're fighting inflation because they know they're going to need all the credibility they need in 2025 when basically there's going to be $4 trillion of treasury, basically, and then you're going to have to convince somebody Okay, to buy four trillion dollars of treasuries, you know, you need a credible central bank who can make the case that, you know, that inflation is going to stay very low and that people should be reasonable in terms of what sort of interest rates they demand for buying these four trillion dollars of treasuries. So I would say the Fed right now is in an okay position, but I actually think that the economy is slowing. Okay, I think that, you know, something snapped in the U.S. economy in May. And I think, you know, this is why jobless claims have been rising sharply over the last six weeks to hit the highest level in, in 10 months. I think consumer confidence got crushed in basically May. Consumer spending, if you look at retail sales, for example, which was weak in April, remained weak in May. And so far, you know, my survey suggests that into June, you know, consumers were not basically looking to spend anymore. And at the same time, you just have this political turmoil that is now breaking out. So I would argue that the risk is that the economy struggle, actually, in the third quarter, which is what we're going, which we're in now, <laughs> in the <laughs> final three months before the U.S. election. I think the economy is going to slow, and I think you know, and I think you know, if I'm right, you will see this in the Friday job report coming out this week. I think the number, I think you're going to see a downward revision of the main number. And I suspect that the June number is going to come in south of 190,000, which is the consensus on Wall Street. So I think from that point of view, we could actually see 
long-term rates or short-term rates going a bit lower. And actually, I bought some gold yesterday, pretty much basically play for the potential ability, the potential for softer, basically, um, a softer uh, economic growth and lower interest rates. Yeah, gold is a perfect topic sort of end our discussion on. I just want to get a bit more granular and like, how do you expect gold to end the year? Maybe it's like, what is really driving gold? You, you mentioned, of course, US election policies and uh, how they're impacting uh, the gold price. But it seems like it's propped up there at, at 2320. It hasn't really dipped below that, although I still see a bit of a gap there and down to 2150. But I'm curious, like, how do you see it developing? And uh, let's assume, a, a, or let, let's go with Biden or Trump, like in, in either case, like how, how will gold perform? I think the way I, I think the way I think about this is very simple, right? I mean, gold has had a huge run up, not because Americans were like somehow chasing gold, right? Because you can see this very clearly in gold ETFs traded in the U.S., for example. Like, there's been in fact anything outflows. There's not that much interest in gold in the U.S. or in Europe, for that matter. I mean, in fact, because interest rates are relatively high, right? So people can park their money in a bank and collect, you know, five percent. Like, why would you buy gold that pays you zero? Right. I mean, so from that point of view, the, 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 the rallying goal has been driven primarily by Asians, by the Chinese. And I'm not even I'm not even talking about the Chinese central bank. It's just that because the, basically it's a shit show in China as far as the Chinese economy is concerned. Interest rates are very low and your Chinese retail investors are very wary of the possibility of an RMB devaluation. By the way, this is the same thing in Thailand, same thing in Vietnam. As a result, you've got a massive increase in retail demand for gold, okay, in Asia. And that's been propping up gold. But whether that stays or not, I, I think that will stay, but is that going to be enough to push gold much higher? I don't know. But there is something that I think is very important as far as the election is concerned that could potentially impact gold. Because at the end of the day, one thing we do know is this. Right. I mean, that goal is the best hedge against geopolitical risk. That much we know. Right. It's just like, you know, after October 7, you know, after Israel, after basically Hamas came into Israel and massacred a thousand people. Guess what? Gold price went through the roof. OK. I mean, it was the only asset that actually performed exactly you expect. So gold serves that purpose. Now, let's think about geopolitical risk in the next month, let's just say. Right. Now, if you are Iran. I would argue for Iran, Iran is not afraid of anybody except for one person. And his per that person's name is Donald J. Trump. Trump was the guy who ordered the assassination of Soleimani. Trump was the one who slapped massive sanctions on Iran. Trump is the only person, only US president I can think of who might just basically order the US Air Force to go bomb Iran until basically uh, there's nothing left in the country. So now after the debate last week, the Iranians are going to think, well, shit, maybe Trump is going to be back in January. So what would you do if you were, you know, Khomeini, thinking that Trump is going to be back? Your nemesis could potentially return as America's basic commander in chief. I would argue the clergy in Iran now have a huge incentive to make a run for nuclear immunity. Now, I can tell you IAEA reports, the last two reports, all basically painting basically an accelerated enrichment process in Iran. That's consistent with what I'm talking about. Except many of your viewers don't know this, but yet this is actually the consensus of expert opinions, which is that at this point, once Iran decides to go for it, it will take them less than one month to produce five nuclear weapons. Okay. So Iran is very close to the finish line, and they might decide to cross that finish line before Trump gets in there so that they become immune to any kind of hostile action from the U.S., because then they become a nuclear power. Now, let me tell you this. It goes without saying, Israel will never stand for it. As, as I said, I live in Israel, and you know I'm, 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 I'm not an Israeli yet, but I can see why the Israelis are absolutely obsessed about this. You would, no country can allow another country that's sworn to its destruction to build a nuclear weapon. So Israel would do anything and everything to stop Iran. Now, Iran knows that. This is why Iran right now is getting its proxies in the region, Hezbollah, the Iraqi militias, okay, the Syrian militias, the Houthis, all basically firing missiles and drones at Israel every single day, okay, in order to bog down Israel so that Iran could potentially make a run. 
or nuclear threshold. And this is actually very important because this situation obviously is not sustainable, it's gonna blow up. And then you might say, when is gonna blow up? Well, Benjamin Netanyahu had just been invited by US Congress to address Congress on the 23rd of July. I think the message is gonna be bringing to Washington is gonna be one, guys, Iran is about to cross the nuclear threshold. Somebody has to do something about this. If you're not, then we're gonna have no choice. So I actually think that this is, this is, a, this is gonna be, I, I, right now, I don't, I can't quite see. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a professor of economics here in Israel, and I teach game theory. Right now, I am hard pressed to to find what could potentially stop this. But this is obviously very bullish gold because it's bullish gold to the extent that you know it means higher, you know, geopolitical risk premium. Also, of course, higher energy price, high oil price because I mean, because if Israel and Iran go, you know, basically at each other, you're going to have to assume that Iran's oil export will be definitely affected very negatively. And most likely, Iran will probably fire missiles at Saudi oil field in order to drive up oil price, okay? So I think from that point of view, this is a good example of the kind of thing that I'm looking for to drive oil price higher. So the combination, now of course, there's another thing, which I think is equally important, which is that there's gonna be a NATO summit in Washington next week. This is the 2024 NATO summit, okay? Just think about that. I'm sorry, I hate Ursula von der Leyen. I think she's a terrible, terrible person, but she's German. She is the biggest Russia hawk. She's just been appointed together with Callis. And now NATO is worried that Trump might get reelected, might be back. NATO, I think they're gonna try to basically make rally around NATO on the 75th basically anniversary to trying to throw a bridge, to offer Ukraine a bridge to NATO membership which I think will be a huge mistake because that will force Russia to basically intensify its attack on basically on, on Ukraine. And then, so from that point of view, you have, it's, it's like, you know, you know, Trump has not been elected yet, but in order to front run, to preempt Trump getting in there, Iran, who fears Trump, might try to basically go for nuclear immunity. NATO, that, equal, that fears Trump equally, might try to basically turn Ukraine into basically a finished business by the time Trump gets in there. <laughs> so all this is very bullish gold. So I just hope your politics agrees with mine, because if you're a gold bug, that's what you're betting for. You're betting that the world is going to go to hell in a, in a, in a handbasket. Thanks to, it, you know, Ursula von der Leyen, Biden and the likes. Yeah. And, and Ursula von der Leyen is going to get reelected as well as ECB president here. Uh, oh, yeah. well, that, I think it was next week. So, um, no, one, one last thing, David, we need to talk about is the role of China in maybe financial warfare, meaning uh, potential BRICS currency that could be backed by gold. Like, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, because that is a uh, non, non uh, what do you call it, a non lethal way to, to, to rage warfare here. But I'm bullshit. curious what your I mean, thoughts that, are. Forget about that. That's just total bullshit. You know, listen, I started my creative national monetary fund. I, I mean, this is what I did for a living for a very <laughs> long time. Okay, I ran currency. My, I was, I ran the number one currency research on Wall Street for three different banks. Okay, and let me tell you this: this is one big bullshit. There's just not enough gold to back all the BRICS currencies, and the BRICS have no incentive to basically enter into a monetary union like what we're seeing basically in your area. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, it's not going to happen. You know, moreover, what people don't realize is that what matters for currencies. Okay, is not the transaction. Sure, I mean, you can basically pay for oil already in RMB, one ruble, whatever. In the end, once the question you have to ask yourself, once the Saudis get paid in the rupee or in RMB, whatever, which currency they want to keep that money in? <laughs> Are they going to keep it in RMB? Are they going to keep it in rupee? The answer is no. Even, I tell you, the Indians have been paying... <laughs> The Russians with rupee, even now the Russians say, please, we don't want rupee, we want dollars. <laughs> so again, this is not about the currency. This is not about the medium of exchange. It's about the store value. And I'm not saying that the dollar is going to remain strong for very long. And that's a different story altogether. And that's a, there's a whole many angles in that we have to get into technology, a lot of other stuff. But let me tell you this, there is zero chance that BRICS are going to issue a common currency, first of all. Because they can already, okay, use their own currencies to make payments, okay, 
for external transaction vis-a-vis -vis each other. So that's not a problem already. They don't even have to go through SWIFT. There are no internal payment system for that to happen. So there, so there is no real rhyme or reason to come up, especially given right now, the RMB, China needs a weak RMB. India is basically daily engaging inter currency intervention to keep its currency weak. The Brazilian real right now is probably this week is the weakest currency in the world. The South African rand, God, it's a basket case. So actually right now, ironically, like the ruble is the strongest currency. How can you, how can you basically, basically challenge the US dollar when you either pursuing a weak currency or you actually have so many problems that you end up with a weak currency? So that makes no sense. So there's, there's no point for them to basically group together. And then again, even if they wanted to, there's just not enough gold in the world to or oil, or everything else, all the commodities in the world, you add them up, is not enough to basically even satisfy 10% of what they need to be able to back every single brick currency with basically some kind of commodity. It would be ridiculous. No, fantastic. Da David, wonderful insights. We, we have to put a bow around it now and to really, uh, we, we have to come back to do, we have to do a part two, maybe come September, maybe after Jackson Hole or see where, where things are at. And uh, maybe the, the Democrats have presented a new uh, presidential candidate here as well uh, in, in the meantime, but we'll have to get you back for part two just before the election, maybe to, to see where things stand. I really appreciated your time and your insights. Where can we find more of your work? So check out, you know, my, if, you, if you're interested, you know, you can check out my YouTube channel, David Wu Unbound on YouTube. And if you want to learn more about my investment strategy, you can come check me out at uh, davidwoonbound.com. No, fantastic. David, wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it. And uh, we need to, as I said, we need to have you back. Like, it was really insightful. I, I love the energy and I love being contradicted. And uh, I like that. It's fun. Like, I love getting contra on all my questions and the energies. This is like, this is a podcast. We're supposed to do this. This is supposed to be exciting. And I definitely think it was entertaining and educating. So thank you so much for that. And uh, we'll, we'll have you back soon. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation here with David Wu. If, you've de if you haven't followed him on, on YouTube yet, make sure to subscribe to his channel. We'll make sure to link to it down below. If you haven't followed us yet, hit that subscribe button. What is stopping you from doing that? We really appreciate it. It helps us bring guests like David onto the channel and have wonderful discussions. Did we ask the right questions? Did you get something out of it? Do you feel educated? Do you feel smarter than before? That's the whole point why we're doing this. We're not trying to give you any investment advice, but we're trying to make you smarter investors. That's the whole point, And we really appreciate you watching our channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Sword Financial.